That was the worst joke ever. Are we good? Good morning. All right, so my name is Branson Matheson. Um, I'm going to give a talk about uh, called TTL of Penetration, and this one's kind of geared towards us. Um, I'm going to cover a bunch of different areas. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about myself, uh, the us versus them idea. I'm going to talk about a penetration, uh, not the bad one. Um, parts one, two, and three. So we're going to look at it from the point of view of you, the attacker, you, the attackee, and then where to insert yourself in the process so you don't become a victim. Uh, and I'll take some questions at the end. So talking a little bit about myself, I've been doing this way too freaking long. Um, been involved in lots of different uh, FLAs and TLAs up and down the coast and in DC and so forth and so on. But mainly I consider myself a geek. I like to do fun stuff with fun things. Um, the, uh, the best question people can say is, you know, I bet you can't get blah to work. And I'll bet I'll find a way to do it. And I, you know, having met many of you, I think a lot of you are the same kind of people. But let's find that out right now. So uh, shows of hands here, Who's, who here is a geek? How about a system administrator? Oh, we got a smattering. High hands, these lights are bright, please. Network administrators. Yeah, a few of those. Security administrators. Okay, what are the rest of you guys? Really? Are you hackers? Put your hands up. Are you white hat hackers? Are you black hat hackers? Wow, no hands. How about that? Well, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Let's look at a little bit of statistics, and we'll go through the white hats first. So for system administrators, there's about one to every 30 associates in system administration out there. And these are numbers that I pulled off of various websites. I've got the citations at the end. Um, for network administrators, there's one to about every 200. So, you know, not bad. And for security administrators, it gets even worse. It's about one to every 1,200. And that's generally large companies, right? Small companies may have one person that wears all three hats, and I didn't really count those kind of guys. So uh, who are they? Who, who are the bad guys? So uh, they are the people that attack. They're the people that are trying to negatively impact your environment. That's the they. And so in general, these can be you know, the script kiddies, the college students, right? That's how the first worm came around. Um, they can be uh, organized crime. They can be governments, both nefarious and not so much. We've seen recently governments doing things that we would consider nefarious, but maybe they don't. So as a question, are there more of them than us? Throw it out there. Are there more of them than us? Yes. Nah, not really. Not when you consider how many people don't want to be hacked. Anybody here wants to be hacked? Yeah, vast silence. So, you know, except for these guys. So we're ahead, right? That means we have so many people. We're ahead of the game. Uh, we have a passion about what we do. We can keep, from, keep people from being hacked. But realistically, that's not true. That's, that's not true at all. Uh, because hackers have a target-rich environment. They can always, always, always find somebody to attack. And oh, by the way, how can you tell this is an, a security administrator's family? So what do you protect? Let's go down the numbers a little bit. Let's go from the bottom of the stack up. So let's talk about network connections just to start. So MAC addresses. There are, I can't read the number, 48 or 281 million billion trillion possible addresses. And we're not supposed to be out of those until 2010. That's a lot. Uh, IP of four addresses, we're almost out, right? There's all kinds of talk about everybody moving to V6. I work at NASA. We are smack in the middle of being pushed into V6. Um, Oh, yeah, and you should get used to it. Uh, there's more V6 addresses than there are uh, square inches on the planet, so I understand. So we're not going to run out of those anytime soon. But think about your attack area. That's a lot of space. But, you know, not everything's addressed. So let's talk about the nodes that might be attacked. So these are interesting numbers that I pulled from census data. And this is just the United States. My apologies to non-Americans, but I didn't have data for outside. That was easy to find. Um, and 80% of households have one computer. Uh, just went up, got married, January 1, and while I was up in Michigan, I saw a whole bunch of people, thank you, I saw a whole bunch of people still using AOL. <laughs> you laugh, and, and doing it happily, very happy. 
But you know, this doesn't even count cell phones, tablets, right? How many people in this room have a tablet? Hands. Yeah. So shit piles of you. And let's talk about who you protect. Well, these are the number of PCs as a, as a percent of sales over the last couple of years. That ain't shrinking. The last bar there is projected for 2012. So there's a lot of machines out there, a whole lot of machines out there. And then machines run software, right? There's tons of different operating systems. These are the current ones that I just came up with in my head. This doesn't include things like VMS or, or RSX 11 or CPM or, believe it or not, NT, which is still out there. I just work at NASA, and like I said, we just got rid of DECnet. So let's talk about what the services that run on those. There's a ton of them, right? Just base services, just things that come with the machine. And then, of course, we all extend it, right? Because we want our servers to do more than just, I don't know, sit there and take up, make heat. And then servers have users. Users have multiple applications they use every single day. Are any of those applications insecure? Have we ever seen vulnerabilities on any of those? Anyone? Anyone? What about web apps? Have we seen any insecurity in any of those applications? Really? And then, of course, we have the weak link in the chain. Right? What is the biggest threat to your environment? Is it your machines? What was that? <laughs> oh, God. Somebody hit him. Um, I'll tell that story later. So um, this is the number of users. And this is the number of users that we have um, typically at work, right? These are professionals and um, 85 million in the US alone, again. And then let's talk about at home. That's another 239 million. So again, this is a great big huge plateau. And you know, we can always trust users, right? They're always great people to have around. They always do the right thing. So how does the math actually work out when you start looking at it? Well, so it's about a 1 to 240 ratio is what I figure. And, and do we think that's good? There's one person protecting to 240 things that can be attacked. That's, that's really not that good, right? What's our life like? Is it good? Are we all bored in our jobs? Do we sit around and do nothing? Eat pizza, tra-la-la? We're always busy doing something. We're always busy trying to find ways to protect ourselves against the next great attack, right? First we get this. Ah, you know, that one transition wasn't supposed to be there. There we go. Then we get this. <laughs> what? I did not put these transitions in. All right, somebody's messing with my presentation. And then we get this. <laughs> right? Actually, the joke I used to tell people is um, we, I worked at um, NASA. I have for on and off for a long time. And we had a grad student that snuck up to a machine and sent mail to president at whitehouse.gov saying, I'm going to kill you. We got a very, very quick and unfriendly visit from all kinds of TLAs and the Secret Service. So um, it happens, and it happens often. So who's got the advantage? Is it us? Do we have the advantage? Throw it out there. Yes, no? No, why not? Well, let's start with this. Knowledge, right? How easy is it to get knowledge on hacks? Is it hard? Are there tools out there that you can just download for free that take not much learning to do? Right? We, we're all mostly familiar with these tools. I, I would, if, if you do any kind of security, you should know most of those tools that are up there. But really, how hard is it to get the information on how to use them? Well, it's not hard, right? Barnes & Noble, go online. Go to websites, right? These are some of the best websites out there. And I put the bottom one on there for you guys that have been around for a while. Uh, don't go to that one at work. And then, of course, where can you get information on how to apply them? Well, you can take CERT courses if you have a lot of money, right? SANS is what, about 3K still? So five, sorry. And then, of course, you can come to a conference, right? Because we just saw how to hack Bluetooth, how to look for a Bluetooth information. So there's a ton of things, and it still gives the advantages to the black hats, right? We're still out of, not in the woods. And then there's the idea of speed, right? Anybody still use, um, <laughs> do you, anybody still use um, old Unix passwords? Or Landman, for instance. 
Why? Because it's very, very easy to attack those things. Nmap can do 255 hosts in a network really fast. Yes, IPv4 network, that's correct. Nessus can do, um, or I'm sorry, Metasploit can crack a vulnerable host, especially if it's running, I don't know, LSAS, and as long as you can type it. I mean, it's really fast. Let's talk about passwords themselves or encryption. Aircrack, pretty speedy. Rainbow tables, instant reverse, right? You can pay the money or you can just go download the 12 terabytes of rainbow tables and you can reverse just about any password that's being used. And there are still lots and lots of Windows Server 2003 and 2008 that are running compatibility mode, which means that you can still attack and get through those servers. It's not hard. But really, this is where the fun comes in. Has anybody played with any of the GPU, the CUDA stuff? It's really scary. That number at the bottom is no bullshit. 224 trillion RC keys. So you think if anybody's played with Hydra or any of the other tools for brute force, it's, it's moderately fast from a, from a point of view if you start playing with it. But really, you start thinking about that, yeah, advantage black hat still. Oh, by the way, do they have rules? Nope. Not a single rule out there. Still advantage black hat. We have rules, right? When we're doing a pen test, we kind of have to stop before we take the bank down. And where does, where does things end up? How does that work out for us? Well, that's how it works out. <laughs> right? So we are not ahead. No matter what we try to do, we're not going to get ahead of this game as much as we'd like to. And the bar for entry gets lower every single day. It gets easier and easier to penetrate. It gets easier and easier to hack. And how do we know this? How do we know they're ahead? Well, here's the amount of vulnerabilities that have come out over the last couple of years. The, the big bar, by the way, is around LSAS time, if anybody's curious. And then this is also how we know. <laughs> Where's Rick? <laughs> of course, I put up killing baby seals and the ceiling comes down. Um, so anybody know what this is? Shout it out. Really? Internet Storm Center. This is your best friend. If you guys are not going there, you need to be going there. Um, this is the amount of time that it will take for an unprotected box to be hacked if you just plug it into the internet on a cable modem. Uh, that's less than 10 minutes. That's less than five minutes in a lot of cases. That's a little scary. And if you're ever curious, run TCP dump on your external interface on your home. It, it's, it's crazy. Crazy how fast it is. So what I want to talk to you guys about is a penetration. And we're going to look at it again in three views. And this is what a, a hacker will do. This is how a hacker might look at a penetration. So they're going to try to figure out who do I attack and why do I attack them, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go down it. Target, reconnaissance, probing. And again, these are not standard on CEH or SANS or however you do it. This is just how I looked at it. Uh, they're going to exploit you, they're going to then hide their tracks, and then they're going to reap their benefits. So they're going to look at a target. And how do you know if you're a target? Well, do you have something I want? Are you a game creator? Are you a, I don't know, porn producer? Right? People steal that stuff all the time. Are you being paid to do it? Also, a great reason to hack, supposedly. Would you be a notch in the saddle if they got you? We used to get people that attack NASA all the time just so they could send mail from a NASA address to their friend saying, ha, we got in. Happened three or four times. And how are they going to get this information about you? Well, Google, right? Anybody who's seen Johnny's stuff. Uh, they can war drive using Kismet. They can use Multigo. Awesome tool. If you haven't played with it, highly recommend it. Put in an email address and you will find all kinds of stuff you didn't know that you didn't know. Uh, fantastic tool. They might use some social engineering to look in on you. They call up and say, hey, can I change my password? So I do pen testing on and off for a living. I can't tell you how many times I've used that. It works. It's scary works, especially with like banks. They might probe you in the good way. Oh, exploit. All right. Damn, this thing's going fast. There. So they might probe you. How are they going to probe you? Well, they're going to use Nmap, Nessus, Xprobe, Saint, Telnet, OWASP, all the different ways that they might look in to see if they can get into your network. And these are open source tools. I didn't even go into using Core or anything like that because I figure most hackers aren't going to have the money for that kind of thing. They're going to exploit you using, the, again, common tools. There's millions of hacking scripts out there if you go look. 
They can use Metasploit and do it very quick. They can use Hydra and brute force your accounts. Um, I have gotten in several times just by pulling the banner of a site, taking the words in the banner, turn around, throwing it at Hydra, and gotten in. It, it, it's, it's scary easy, on, on route, in, in fact. <laughs> they're going to cover their tracks. So they're going to clean out the access logs so that you didn't know they were there. They're going to hide their code. They're going to uh, install a root kit so they can get back in when they want to. And then they're going to collect a reward, right? They're going to access all the information they want. They're going to steal the money they want. They're going to plot, you know, pivot and turn and start attacking other networks and other hosts nearby, this, that, and the other. So that's what a hacker does. And, and, and that's pretty obvious. So what do we see? We the protectors. We the, the, you know, the guardians of the realm. So we see it as a timeline. And each point is significant. T0, which I funny think is that, but realistically, it's when they decide you're a, a target. And then what they're going to do is say, who should I attack? Which person is this? And so the question you have to ask yourself is, are you a risk? Are you a risk? So what's the definition of risk? This is like a textbook definition. It's also somewhat amusing if you think about it. But are you a government agency? Are you a financial agency? Are you a media provider? How about an internet service provider hosting all tons of stuff? Do you have things that they want, right? <laughs> software development, that's a famous one. A lot of people have been in uh, looking for various pieces of software, both free and open source, right? Um, we've had a number of distributions, Linux distributions and software distributions that were hacked in, in, in place, and then people downloaded crack code and put it on their boxes. Or you do something I don't like you to do. Um, and this would be, you know, especially governments, right? Universal, they didn't get just taken down, did they? They did, pretty easily. So they should consider themselves a high-risk target. Are they using something that would be easy to attack? So are you using any of these things? Any, any, any software up there? Anybody not using? So you're never going to know if you're being assessed, right? There's no way you can read somebody else's mind and say, ooh, they're thinking about attacking me. Maybe I should be careful. No, not really. But you can look at your own data and try to determine, am I a target? Am I something that's going to be attacked? And you should ask, put that into your risk evaluation. When you're talking to your management about money, or you're talking to your providers about servers, or services, or bandwidth, or anything else, you need to start thinking about these things, because they will impact you. So the next thing they're going to do is they're going to go try to get some reconnaissance on you and see if they can get some information off of you. And again, you're probably not going to know they're doing it. You might, but it's not likely. It just depends. And there's a, all kinds of indicators out there. There might be some business indicators, right? Support might get some more hang-up calls. Uh, you might get, hey, can we get a copy of your phone list, please? Or your email lists? You might get invalid support calls. Hey, I'm Jimmy Buffett. Can you change my password? Is anybody recording those? I don't know. What about non-direct indicators? How about increasing friend requests to associates that work for a bank? I've gotten in that way been able to pull enough information that I could get to, a, um, get to a, a person's Facebook, pull information there, turn pivot, use the information against their account, and found a, a crackable password. It's actually not that hard. It's kind of scary. And the next thing they're going to do is probe, right? They're going to look for ways to try to get in. And so what can you look for when they're probing? Well, the obvious one, increased network load, right? We assume if they're going to attack from the outside, you might start looking for that. So send SYN attacks, FIN attacks, this, that, and the other, reset attacks. Your general load on your servers might go up. So if you're running mail servers and a pa or web servers or other kind of internet services that you monitor, you might look at the load and see if you can see that it's changed. You'll see changes in your application logs, right? Your mail log might start to have some weird stuff in it. The HTTP error log will probably get a lot bigger, especially if they're trying all kinds of CGI attacks. And then they're going to exploit you, right? They're going to go in and try to break in. And when they do it, does anybody ever know exactly when they're exploited? Yes, no? Not usually. If you have a really good IDS, you might catch the exploit packet going across and have a time. But you're making the assumption that that was the time they did it, right? So you still really don't know. So once they've done that, they're going to penetrate from that point that they've broken in. 
and they're going to do all kinds of things. They're going to uh, change files on the system. They're going to change the behavior of the system so they can get in again. Right, root kits do that. They're going to change the behavior of applications. They're going to change the behavior of your network traffic so that they can catch more information. And then they're going to come behind themselves and clean up, right? Once an attacker gets in, the first thing he wants to do is make sure nobody noticed he got in. So they'll put a hole in your WTEMP log. They'll remove user accounts. They'll change the behavior of applications and network traffic. And then they're just going to reap the reward. They're going to spend all this time to get in, and then they may, again, pivot. They may pull credentials. We've had instances where people pulled um, .ssh uh, known hosts files and then turned and used the same local credentials against those remote hosts and broke in. How many people have the same password in multiple sites? Lots. I can tell you almost all. And once it's in, it's very hard to know you've gotten them out. I would say it's almost impossible to know that you've really gotten them out, unless you've got extremely good backups and you know for sure exactly when they've gotten in. So I think we can all agree penetration is bad, right? That's, that's all an agreeable term. But so how do you minimize the risk to your environment? What do you do? Well, you insert yourself in the process. Big pun, nobody's laughing. It's terrible. So let's look at the anatomy of a penetration part the third. And we're going to look at each point in the timeline, and I'm going to give you guys some software, some ideas, things you can do to kind of keep yourself from becoming the victim. So the first thing to do is you have to figure out when you are a victim. How many people have looked at their, <laughs> tailed their HTTP logs, or run TCB dump on their external interface with no filters? Right? This is what you see. Right? Just crap, 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 crappity crap. But this is what you should be looking for. You're trying to find that, that one nugget that said, oops, something happened. So what do you have to do? What is the first thing you have to do to understand what all that noise really means? You have to baseline. You have to understand when you're looking at your data, what is normal. Now in this crowd, what is normal is rather subjective. But what is normal is important. You have to understand normalcy. You have to understand what works correctly in your network all the time and it's acting the way it should. And so let's look at that with that idea in mind. Let's go back through this timeline and try to figure it out. So who to attack, right? You can't change who you work for, especially in this economy. That's just not a good idea. You can't change the information that's out on the net. You know, there are all kinds of trust us companies. We'll go fix your internet, uh, what is it, your profile so that the other people will not find when you, they've posted really bad reviews about you. That's BS. Anybody seen the internet archive knows it's crap. But what you can do is you can baseline, right? You can go out and pull information about yourself and look at it and have a good idea of what you are and who you are and what you look like. So has anybody ever Googled themselves? Their name? Hands? Cool. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, scan social networks. I can't emphasize that one enough. Company name, high profile people's names. You really, really want to tend to spend the time to do that. Maltigo is a really cool tool for doing that. If you buy the commercial version, which is entirely reasonable, it will do a lot of this work for you. Um, and it gives you a nice, pretty chart, gives you stuff you can use in reports. It's great, great management fodder. But I highly recommend that one. You need to critically examine publicly available information. Your website. So I have definitely seen paths to local resources and websites all the time, in source. Look at your sales propaganda. Look at the information that your sales force is putting out because invariably they leak stuff that you'd really probably rather they didn't. Make sure white papers for your company go under critical review for security. That's not to say censorship, but you want to make sure that what they send out is what you expect them to send out and not what some hacker could turn around and use against you. And a lot of that's subjective. You can't make that decision. I can't stand up here and give you a specific set of credentials to use. But a reconnaissance. Again, you're probably not going to know that they're coming after you. You really probably won't. But you can baseline. You can start to look at your application logs. Highly recommend any of those tools. Splunk's probably the most current one. A lot of people are using that. I saw a really good presentation at CarolinaCon last year about Logly, also quite sexy. Even if you just use uh, older tools um, to monitor your stuff, I, you, you really need to monitor it. Put system monitoring in place. Install Nagios to monitor your Unix boxes. Install Cacti to monitor your SNMP traffic. Use Webalizer to look at your web traffic. Monitor your service call loads. How many people use, use a ticketing system? Really? 
How do you get your work? Do you get emails? Do you get phone calls? How do you know when something is fixed and something's not fixed? I recommend if you're, even, even for small shops, the ticketing system helps you monitor your load and manage your load. And there's all kinds of discussions on that. But install something, use RT, use track, use any of the tools that are out there. So when they're probing, how will you know when you're being probed? Boy, that's a loaded question. <laughs> Baseline, that's a loaded answer. Install an IDS, right? Snort's not that hard. It's really not. Install Awesome. It's a nice open source toolkit, comes on an ISO, and by the way, it has most of these tools that I'm mentioning installed. I, can't, I, I recommend it a lot, a whole lot. Uh, review your application logs regularly. Again, Webalizer. Use Google's, um, they have a, a web uh, traffic analysis stuff. Uh, if you're under Windows, use Event Log Explorer. Start getting an idea of what looks normal. If you don't know what looks normal, you're not going to know what looks bad. Review your system logs. Uh, how many people here get their log watch mails from root? Show of hands. How many people read them every day? Yeah, I don't, know, I don't believe it. <laughs> that signal to noise right there is, is huge. And unless, unless you're pedantic about it, you're, not, you're still going to catch it. But you should be. You should absolutely be doing it. There's an older tool called NTOP. Do not put it on a public facing interface. It's known, known to be crackable. But the data that it produces for looking at your internal network is fantastic. I highly recommend setting that up. Put it somewhere that's safe. Be very careful with it. But set it up so I can see all the traffic crossing your backbone. And boy, will you see things you didn't know you didn't know. And it's really easy to see. We saw an attack using NTOP once just on a graph that showed ports over time, and we saw a huge spike on one port, and that's all it took. I mean, it's that easy. It's really, really that easy. Aggregate your information. Centralize your syslogs, right? If you're doing Splunk or Logly or something like that, you're going to do it anyway. But hey, install Awesome and use that. It's got it built in again. Let's look at penetration. How will you know when you're being penetrated? Baseline. Do some network monitoring. Put an IDS on the inside, right? How many people have an IDS on the outside? Yeah, how many people have an IDS on the inside? Yes, and that's the way to do it. Very, very good. Monitor your interior traffic. Again, NTOP. Can't say enough about that. That tool has proved very useful to us. Uh, Snort, easy. Uh, install network devices, or monitor your network devices and manage your signal to noise. Um, so one of the problems we used to get is we had people that would automatically send us mail when they checked in code. And we had a bunch of programmers. So we would get literally a bunch of mail today. And eventually, people are going to write a filter into their exchange or into their MUT or whatever they're using. And it's all going to go into the circle file, right? Dev null. It's going to go bye bye. So you do need to manage your signal to noise and make sure that what you're getting is useful. If you don't spend the time to do that, then you're not going to get any useful information. You, the, the nugget of gold that's going to pass by is going to pass right by. So load, monitor your systems, right? If you're under Windows, Spiceworks is free. It's adware. You can pay for it. It's not that bad. Nagios, also fantastic. Can't say enough about that. Uh, changes to key files. If you're using Puppet or Chef or any of those tools, right, they'll do some of that for you. If you're not, you can install Tripwire. If you're not even doing that, take the basic thing and use RCS or Subversion or Git or something. Check your system config files in so that you know when something's changed, right? It's not that hard. And by the way, it gives you change control really, really nicely. Um, how are you going to catch them when they clean up, right? When are you going to know? Well, so the first thing you're going to do is clean up is try to remove any traces of themselves. You really want to keep all that important information on something that they can't change, something that's immutable. So anybody still have line printer with green bar? I mean, if you've ever read the cuckoo's egg, that's how he caught him. It's a very simple but effective tool. There are um, several tools out there for CD and DVD logging that will do multi-session so that you can just store it straight to your DVD every night and you'll have it somewhere so that you can go back and refer to it and you can actually find when they broke in so that you don't have to completely wipe machines. And mon uh, monitor for change. Again, Puppet, Chef, all good tools. Uh, OSEC, OSIRIS, Tripwire. Again, these are Unix-based tools, but very, very effective. And have a plan, right? How many have a disaster recovery plan? How many have an incident handling plan? Are they one and the same? Should they be? When you have an incident, is it a disaster? Depends on how far they got, right? So it's something to think about. Make sure you have a security awareness plan, right? Because who's the weakest link? Is it us? Well, when we set up 
Airports on management fee lands, yes, we're the weakest link. There's a story there. But your users are generally your weakest link, right? They're the ones that are going to click on that random email. They're the ones that are going to install LimeWire on their business computer. They're the ones that are going to hurt you. So let's explain and let me sum this all up. Your time to live out on the internet is completely dependent on how involved you are with the information that's available on a day-to-day -day basis. If you just take things in stride, if you just put your head down and try to you know, upgrade this software, fix that problem, install this new server, you're going to miss the important parts. You have to stay involved. And it's a scope thing. It's one of those things where you usually can't see the forest for the trees. So um, the one, of, not the previous talker, but the one for that talked about having kind of an offsite where they kind of critically evaluated how they did security. That's a fantastic idea. I don't necessarily recommend putting yourself in the basement for you know a week with pizza only, but get off site, sit down to coffee at Starbucks or somewhere better, and have a discussion about your security. Have a discussion about the vectors that they may come in, and start thinking about it. You want to insert yourself in that process every time. Evaluate your network as attacker. Start thinking as if you were the enemy. If you were going to penetrate yourself, boy, that's odd. <laughs> How would you do it? What would you do to penetrate yourself? Um, many have come before you, right? Lots of people have thought about this problem. Use their tools. Google it. There's tons of things out on the net. Review your ports often. Often. Make it a part of your weekly meeting schedule. Sit down. Have a 10-minute segment at the end of your meeting say, okay, did anything new show up in the reports today? And assign a report to some group or each individual in the group. You've got to manage that signal to noise because, again, if you don't, it's going to disappear. Get your colleagues in the process, not just your direct colleagues, not the assistant men sitting next to you or the network admin in the other room. You also want to get your management involved because if you don't have management buy-in, it doesn't happen, right? That's a security awareness principle. And you don't want to be in the heart horse barn door process, right? You don't want to have management coming back to you saying, why the F did you let this happen? We need to lock everything down so that nobody can work, right? Because security is the inverse of convenience. Anybody disagree with that at all? So make it a part of your weekly work routine. Keep good backups, both of your systems and your data and your configuration. And I would keep them all independently. Right? If you keep all your backups in one spot and they compromise the backup server, how screwed are you? Really screwed. Really, really screwed. Uh, keep good change control processes in place. Don't make changes to systems that you don't have to during production hours. Make sure that everybody is aware of the changes that are happening. Make sure they're thought out with, okay, how is this going to make me vulnerable or invulnerable? What is this going to do to my security baseline? So in short, you need to stay involved. You really, really do. It's, it's, it's incredibly important. And baseline your systems. I can't say that word enough. I know you saw it about 100 times in this presentation. And it's because you really need to take the time to do it. It's extremely important. So that was quick. Any questions? Yes? Good question. So the question was, how do you baseline once you're already in operation? Well, so here's the, here's the corollary to that. Can you baseline when you're not in operation? You can't. You kind of have to be in a production mode to start looking at your data and determine what's valid and what's not. So you really kind of need to think about it in those terms. Any other questions? Yes? What do I trust to secure IBV6? A pair of Dykes. <laughs> Quite honestly, I haven't gotten that. <laughs> Seriously, I haven't gotten that far into IBV6. Uh, we're just going through the implementation stages now. Uh, a good person to ask that is Brett Thorson. Uh, he is, he's the one that implemented V6 here at, the, here at the con, so he would have a, a much better detail on that one. I'll get to you in a second, Lisa. So I'll hand over here. Where? Okay, Lisa. Talk about um, it depends. If you want to pay the money for a vendor that has, oh, I'm sorry. So her question was, um, let me see if I can, I'm trying to think how I can say this again, reframe this. Yes. So her question was, can you use an IDS for network 
uh, reconnaissance detection or probing. Which, you know, it, will it go all the way to doing network reconnaissance? And you can. It just depends on how detailed you get with it, right? An easy thing you can do is put a fake user in your uh, database, in your user database, Dolly Parton. Right? If you see Dolly Parton cross your IDS, you know you have a problem. Credit card companies do this by putting fake credit card numbers in with the good ones. And then they look for that data to cross all their auditing systems. When they see that data cross, they say, aha, we have a problem because it never should be used. So any further questions? Yes? So the question is, will IPv6, the implementation of it, lead to a whole new set of vulnerabilities? It's kind of a leading question because any layer, when you add complexity to a system, you make it inherently easier to attack, right? So my, my straight answer would be yes. Now, v6 has built into it new layers of security. So it's kind of a catch as catch can. I think we don't know what we don't know yet with v6. I think there's a lot of pieces to that that need to be evaluated before we can even determine uh, what it is. When, at NASA, we are implementing it in a very trial basis, but like the Air Force has completely implemented it. So I, I don't know how far along those answers really are. I would like to see a really, really good talk on IPv6 security. I really would, and I haven't seen one yet. So any other questions? Are you going to post this? Yes, these slides will be posted. Uh, they'll be posted. Shmukon posts them, and I will have them at my site as well, which is uh, sandsite.org. I'll have the slides up there. Good presentation, bad presentation? Okay, shameless plug since I run it. Everybody take your barcode, go to feedback.schmoocon.org, put your barcode in, make an account. I kid you not, there's a total of 15 reviews so far. One five, there are 1,700 people at this conference. Please put some reviews in. Not mine. I don't, this isn't a shameless plug for myself. But I definitely want to see some reviews for some other people. So thank you very much. Early lunch. Woo!